Hello, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, in whichever part of the world you are. A very warm welcome to our session called Genetic Disorders and Rare Diseases Patient Co-Creation. It's my utmost pleasure to welcome our panelists. We have with us um, Julie, uh, who represents the Golan Syndrome Alliance. We also have Camilla, uh, who is from the Leo Pharmaceutical Company. We have Dr. Ivana from the World Health Organization. A very warm welcome to all of you once again. Uh, it's a pleasure to be discussing as part of this Global Patient Congress as to how rare diseases uh, have been affected by COVID-19. Uh, everybody has been dealing with it as it is. Living with rare diseases is quite a challenge. Um, but maybe I should start off with some background which uh, covers that Rare Diseases International has mapped the main issue that has been affecting patients worldwide. Um, most of them have, um, I think, uh, association with genetics and um, the declarations and the statements have been shared with WHO as well as United Nations by the Rare Disease International. There is definitely an acute shortage of accessible and effective diagnostic services. And we do not have quality and effective genetic counseling services to support patients and the carers. It's pretty challenging for us to live with that. There are many undiagnosed and genetic rare diseases um, and also syndromes without a name. While there are major innovative treatments and cures across the world, many patients cannot have access to these gene therapies or biologic monoclonal antibodies and some other new small molecule therapies. Moreover, because of the pandemic, uh, these patients have suffered even more. We will be discussing these issues today. And uh, our session will look at patient co-creation within gene therapy and cell therapies. Yeah, the research and development, advocacy. And we will be using skin disorders as a unique case to highlight these issues. So once again, to our panel members, a very warm welcome. And I think I will start off with Julie. Um, Julie, um, you are representing the Golan syndrome, but I'm not too sure if everyone in our audience is familiar with it. So can I invite you to briefly share how common or uncommon the syndrome is? Moreover, is there like a specific age group or is there a gender bias when it comes to this um, condition? Uh, would economic influence, uh, affluence have, have an influence on, on the diagnosis? Maybe some of these basic uh, info, could you start off with sharing that? I'd be happy to. Would you like me to share my entire presentation now or answer your, your questions? Uh, maybe you could answer this first and then we move on to the presentation proper. Yeah, sure. Just, just the, a brief. Sure. There were several questions mixed together there. So yes. Gorlin syndrome uh, affects a number, a small number of people, one in about 31,000. All ages, uh, signs and characteristics can appear at birth. And uh, well, many of your questions are answered in my presentation. In the so presentation. <laughs> okay. So sure. Please go ahead and share your presentation. Thank you. Hello, everyone, and thank you. As you heard, my name is Julie Breinizer, and I'm the executive director of the Gorland Syndrome Alliance. I'm going to jump right in because I have a lot to cover today in a short amount of time. What I'll be reviewing is what Gorlin syndrome is, the burdens of life with it, 
our community's unmet needs and the additions to our unmet needs with the impact of COVID-19. Gorlin syndrome, as I said, is a rare disorder affecting about one in 31,000 people. It is autosomal dominant. Gorlin syndrome can affect every organ system with over 100 possible manifestations. For most of us, basal cell carcinomas are the most burdensome characteristics, some of us having thousands in our lifetime. There is no cure, just treatment options for the multitude of manifestations. I have this sign here just to ask that if you have a sensitive stomach, don't like seeing challenging photographs, the next slide you'll want to close your eyes or turn, turn your eyes away from the computer. This slide is a collage of photographs of people with Gorlin syndrome. I'm going to start by describing them clockwise from the upper left. That photo is a child with Gorlin syndrome with multiple basal cell carcinomas that she's recently had treated with two different methodologies. One is photodynamic therapy and the other is laser ablation. So somewhere one methodology was used on some and a different one on her chest. The next photograph is of the back of a man with Gorlin syndrome and all those red areas are basal cell carcinomas. On the upper right is a woman who has completed six weeks of five floor uracil with the significant scabbing from that. On the lower right is a little child about to have surgery for hydrocephalus, another manifestation of Gorlin syndrome. The next one over of the year is actually my year last August. Started with a, about a two to three millimeter lesion and with Mohs surgery, it took a significant amount of skin to get clean borders, clear borders. And this photograph was taken just before a skin graft was placed. The little boy there has, is two days post-op from a surgery for, to, the, to remove two keratocystic odontogenic tumors. One was in his right mandible, his upper jawbone, and the other was a recurrence in the left man in the left mandible. The first, I'm sorry, the first one was in the right maxilla, the upper jawbone, and the other one on the left side was the recurrence in his mandible that had he had had surgery just two years before for that. And on the bottom left are is our signature manifestation, tiny little pits in the palms and soles of our hands. Some of us have a lot and some of us have very few. Okay, for those of us who didn't wanna look, I'm moving on now and you can look again. The challenges of, of the diagnosis of Gorlin syndrome are tremendous because we have such a wide variety of symptoms. Putting the puzzle pieces together to make the diagnosis is difficult. Late last year and early this year, the Gorlin Syndrome Alliance conducted a survey globally. And this revealed that the diagnosis of Gorlin Syndrome took over 10 years in, 20, in greater than 25% of the respondents. There were 166, 86. The ramifications of a delayed diagnosis are tremendous for us. Increased sun exposure can lead to more BCCs. Brain injury from hydrocephalus is a possibility if diagnosis is significantly delayed. The KCOTs, the keratocystic odontogenic tumors, cause loss of bone and loss of teeth, permanent teeth and baby teeth. And ionizing radiation from x-rays, CAT scans, that sort of thing, it can trigger the growth of basal cell carcinomas. It's like pouring fertilizer on the garden. These two photographs are examples of that. The individual on the left had had a medulloblastoma, a malignant brain tumor that was treated prior to diagnosis of Gorlin syndrome with radiation therapy. And all those black lesions there are, is just a blanket of basal cells. And the person on the right had multiple CAT scans for abnormal growth of bones in his skull and this was again before diagnosis with Gorlin syndrome and he's pretty well blanketed with basal cells as well. The burdens of life with Gorlin syndrome are many. Permanent scarring from multiple basal cells that often recur over time, particularly if the margins are not clear. Regular appointments with 
physicians of multiple specialties are necessary. 63% of survey respondents saw a specialist every three to six months. The time out of work, school, and life activities for these appointments, procedures, and recovery is tremendous. The respondents in our survey missed on average 24 days a year. That's over a month of, of work days. We have a constant need to limit our sun and UV radiation exposure, as well as that of ionizing radiation. The lack of healthcare provider knowledge of Gorlin syndrome and the need to advocate for ourselves and our families is huge and can be a tremendous challenge for us. The financial burdens vary from where you are in the world, but they are tremendous. And the need for outstanding healthcare coverage is essential. There are very significant psychological burdens due to the myriad of manifestations. So just a few of these are fear, depression, anxiety, and frustration. We, like many other rare diseases, have many, many unmet needs. We all would love a cure. We'd love more treatments with fewer immediate and long-term side effects, such as scarring, pain, loss of time from work, and medication side effects. We'd all love to have improved knowledge by our healthcare providers as well as a willingness to listen to knowledgeable patients. In many, many cases, the patients and their families know more about their disease than their physicians. There's an essential need for recognition and acceptance of the value of the patient voice by regulators, pharma, and researchers. No one else can or should speak for what it's like to be the patient or the caregiver. Working with Leo Pharma and their R&D partner in the United States has opened our eyes at the GSA to how much of an impact we can have and how working together can improve recruitment and the trial participant experience. This has been wonderful for us. Let's go on to the impact of COVID-19. The delay in treatment of all manifestations of ours and every rare disease is significant. And I don't think that we're really going to see the full impact for, for ourselves or for other rare diseases for some time. For us, we'll have larger skin cancers, we'll have larger jaw tumors, and, we'll, and the delay of diagnosis will be even more significant. Unfortunately, now there's a fear of going to the doctor. Until the pandemic, hospitals and clinics were places where we could go to be treated, to be cured, and have diseases prevented. Now we're hesitant to go because we don't want to contract COVID-19. In a pandemic-ridden world, care of people with rare diseases like Gorlin syndrome must be given a high level of priority because their needs are unique and extensive. The long-term ramifications of treatment delays that I've already covered is, is significant. And clinical trials can and should become as pandemic proof as possible. Using at-home photography to follow skin issues with standardized methodology. Having visiting nurses do blood draws and monitor vital signs to reduce hospital or clinic visits. And having couriers deliver, deliver trial medication would improve the potential participants' comfort level and willingness to, to participate and, and be in the trial. So in conclusion, Gorlin syndrome is a multi-system rare genetic disorder whose most burden manifestation are in adults are the BCCs. Diagnosing Gorlin syndrome is a challenge because of the variety of characteristics that may be present, as well as the limited healthcare provider knowledge. Healthcare and the lack of that lack of knowledge adds to the burdens of patients and caregivers. Treatments are limited and far from ideal. We need more options. And the limit of the impact, I'm sorry, of COVID the COVID-19 pandemic will take years to fully understand as treatment delays will cause increase in size of tumors as well as further delaying manifestations and, and the diagnosis. If you'd like more information on Gorlin syndrome, please contact us at gorlinsyndrome.org. 
we have three pillars of our work. One is support, information, and the third is providing, working with researchers and pharmaceutical companies to develop better treatments and a cure. Thank you very much. Thank you, Julie. That presentation really covered a lot of information, very useful for our various stakeholders to understand what a patient's going through, especially during this very challenging time. Um, I guess it's only proper for me to now invite Kamala to, to share how Leo Pharma is, is uh, playing a role at this time and even otherwise, you know, um, there, there have been some clinical trials and we are interested to know more about that. Uh, Kamala, over to you, please. Thanks, I'll be happy to. Well, I think uh, you can help me with the presentation, correct? Thank you very much. I am super delighted to be here today and um, speak together with, with this uh, distinguished audience and this distinguished speaker panel. My name is Camilla and I'm here to talk a little about uh, Nothing About You Without You, which is the commitment at Leo Pharma to the community that we work for and work with and uh, basically which is our raison d'etre in terms of why we're here. My presentation is fourfold, so I'm going to talk a little about from patient to partner, so the paradigm shift that we have been witnessing over the last two decades. Then I'm going to talk a little about the partnership for change, which very much feeds into what Julia was just talking a little about before. And then I'm talking about the critical success factors for working together and how that's going to be finally looking in the future, which is the last point of my presentation. Be happy to take any questions afterwards. So as, as you know better than most, we have seen over the last two decades a shift from, you can say, the passive receiver of care and medicines to the active participant in medicines R&D. So this is a fabulous, you can say, transition of also how we, how we in industry develop new solutions for people in need for these solutions. So back in the days, uh, it was all thanks to the HIV community taking a very active role in the disease management. At that point in time, there were no management to be offered, but they, as you know, that changed. And then, of course, the whole breast cancer movement, then also other diseases joined. And the whole, you can say, consumer healthcare, consumerism started uh, in, in, in those days. Since then, there has been a lot of activities going on. So people who are patients, meaning affected by a condition are no longer just patient. They are actually very active, not only in their own disease management, but also beyond themselves. They're members of communities. They even lead communities, as Julie Brenzer is an example on. And most importantly for us, they are now considering us as partners because our business is their business. So people who are patients want to be part of Medicines R&D and at Leo and many other places, uh, that I'm aware of, we really welcome this as an absolutely um, important factor of the present and the future of medicines R&D. We have made a small film, uh, which basically is very much in a concrete example on how this actually looks like in reality of our partnership with, with the uh, Golden Syndrome Alliance and Julie Brennan's group. Uh, it is an example of how the nothing about you without you takes real form and shape in everyday life. I don't have the opportunity to show the video to you right now, but if you want to see it, we are more than happy to, um, to uh, display it at our booth. We have a virtual booth here at this IEPA conference, and we will also be, of course, manning this booth and happy to answer whatever questions you have. What are the critical success factors I'm often asked in, in terms of uh, where to engage, when to engage? Well, there's a lot of you can say spots around uh, the early value chain, the late value chain. Basically, my answer always is whenever there's a key decision that affects people with uh, a condition, patients, you need to include patients. So at Leo, it starts from the very get-go where the ideas of future therapies are, are fostered, you can say. Our understanding of that, of course, is based on science and medical science and, and you can say molecular science. 
but it also, needless to say, needs to be bolstered by disease experience, you can say input, research, advice. So the red uh, squared element here, identification and assessment of new opportunities is definitely where things starts and which is also uh, the example that Julie Brenders and I um, are, are, are showing in this presentation. The um, other aspect I wanted to make sure that I touch upon is uh, when we start in the clinical trials, they also need to be informed by patient insight advice and research because we don't just want to make sure that the molecule hypothetically is valuable when it becomes a medicine, hopefully. We also want to make sure that the whole contesting of the molecule, also known as clinical trials, that these trials are absolutely, um, you can say, appealing to people. People want to join them and they want to stay in the trials. Because if we can't conduct the clinical trials, there will be no solutions whatsoever. And also, if people feel that the trial is not for them, once they have joined and they drop out, that can either delay or in worst case, actually prevent a molecule from reaching the hands of people downstream, people who need them, patients. So all the bullets you see here and many more um, are actually, you can say, time points in the clinical medicines R&D development where we recommend and where we at LEO uh, solicit people uh, who are patients for input, for understanding, to gain uh, research data to make decisions that are the right ones. Most recently, we were helped by the FDA who have given, um, who have brought, uh, published a new guidance in June. And if you haven't read this guidance already, I really recommend you do it. It's a very descriptive guidance to pharmaceutical companies and academia, other, uh, you can say, entities that are focused on making new solutions for patients. And it gives a very good understanding and good direction on what we should be thinking of in pharma, what we should be soliciting uh, in the patient community, what kind of data points we should be making sure that we have, and so forth and so forth. It's a very comprehensive document and um, definitely we have, of course, aligned all our methodologies, everything we do at LEO to match this document so that we make sure that also regulators um, will appreciate the value of what we're doing at LEO. The outlook definitely is positive, if you ask me. We already now have a number of evidence points, you can say. Um, there's a lot of articles now coming out that document why this is important, why working together, as we've been talking about, is so important. Um, optimizing performance across the entire value chain is one thing. We make better products, we make faster products. We also have a positive effects on uh, effect on the clinical recruitment and retention. So as I mentioned, if we actually design the clinical trials together with people who are representative of the trial population, we are better able to understand if we have a trial that is seen as valuable and people want to stay in. If we don't do that, we may lose, uh, we may have a risk of delaying the trial or even worst cases, we had to cancel the trial. And needless to say, that is a lose-lose situation. Opportunities for researchers to learn from patients as disease experience experts. This is something that goes without saying, and I know that many of you intuitively will not to this, but you know also that it hasn't been the, the business as usual until the last maybe decade that it has been so. But now it is so, and it is an immense learning po potential here. We see it also in Leo Pharma every day. Then, of course, also a challenge the whole way of thinking. So it often leads to improved research designs, uh, to new delivery and to new dissemination of science. This is fantastic. This is something we definitely welcome. This is something we need. Last but not least, it also expands our understanding of innovation. So in the traditional thinking, pharmaceutical companies are the ones that are transforming ideas of solution into actual solutions. But as you also know, Patients are also innovators. And in Europe and beyond Europe, there are networks in, in, in Europe. One example is patient innovation, whereby people who are patients and also innovators, they come together in a network and they actually share their solutions. They are inventors of healthcare. This is amazing. And I think this will be complementary to the health, you can see innovation that is going on in industry and in academia going forward. Oops, sorry. 
Last but not least, I just wanted to make sure that uh, you know where to find us. We are at the booth today, um, the Leo Pharma booth, and also um, you are always welcome to visit our website. You're always uh, welcome to visit me, um, send me an email, um, whatever is, is, is appropriate and good for you. I am very much uh, looking forward to take any questions. So thank you so much for the opportunity and um, I'll pass the word back to the moderator. Thank you. Thanks, Kamala. It was a very insightful presentation. Um, I'm just um, wondering, uh, I have um, been looking at some of the clinical trials uh, that are being run for Golden Syndrome, and I happen to see about 35 of them that are being conducted in the US and Europe. And uh, maybe later we'll come to the issue of the rest of the world. Yeah, and there's Asia and uh, other parts of the world we can talk about later. Um, maybe it's time for me to actually invite Dr. Ivana uh, from WHO to share her thoughts on the current issue that we are discussing. Ivana, please. Thank you. I'm just actually sharing the screen. I hope you'll see in a minute the actual presentation or the first slide. Can you see it? Um, we are seeing your email so far. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. 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 Then, uh, Almost there. <laughs> Almost there. Okay. Here is the presentation. Yes. Try again. Is it now visible? Yes, it is. Okay. And you might want to start your presentation slideshow. Yeah, thank you. And thank you for, for inviting me to, to join the, um, the conference. It's really a very important topic. And um, uh, it's, it's really a pleasure uh, for me to be with you. Uh, we met last time uh, in the side event of the World Health Assembly in Geneva. And at that time, we didn't know how precious opportunity we had to meet each other live and in, in person comparing now to the um, screen uh, meetings. But anyway, this is um, for the time being. Okay, so um, you, you're seeing on the first slide um, that I'm actually talking about WHO approach to, to support access because access for us is really um, the most important um, issue and uh, um, our focus on cell and gene therapy products, um, their um, safety and efficacy is, is basically what I'm going to, to talk about. So norms and standards for ensuring safe and effective cell and, and gene therapy uh, products um, is uh, the area in which we work. And I'll also show some other initiatives that WHO is uh, um, doing. So let me see if I can move to the next. Can you see the next slide? Yes. WHO um, action okay. plan. Can I request you to click on the slideshow um, ah, okay. icon at the toolbar below? Right. The fourth. The fourth. Uh, right at after, the bottom. Right at the bottom of your slide. You see notes? Ah, yeah, that, that one. Can you click that, please? Okay, it says slideshow, resume slideshow, right? Yes. It, um, it doesn't really show, yeah. right? Yeah, it doesn't. Is okay. second slide um, on the screen? Yes, yes slide's is. there, yes. Uh, it's uh, there. Just, just uh, shut that uh, WebEx meeting. Remote. Yeah, maybe. Or maybe I can maybe the small window below. Can you close that, yeah. please? Is that better? Yeah. Can you see? Yeah. Yes, better. Okay. So yeah, in our five-year action plan to improve quality and safety of health products. Um, uh, basically, uh, important issue is, is really to increase regulatory preparedness for public health emergencies. And this is one of, of um, the areas where 
um, many of you um, are aware that we work on. And uh, in impact of, of COVID, I'll mention in a minute, caused a lot of delays in, um, in conducting activities related to cell and gene therapy products. So um, for the time being, actually, um, I'm just uh, sharing the third slide with cell and gene therapy products uh, under development. And the situation in US clearly shows um, really a number of products under development and the focus on oncology, um, while genetic disorders are second largest therapy area. And this is uh, indeed uh, very important for, for us to, to understand what are the needs and what are the concerns from patients' perspective in order to address these issues while we are developing standards and also um, helping regulators and developers of these products to come up with safe and effective uh, um, products. And third, uh, of course, uh, um, for, for rare diseases is, is, is also showing um, quite, a, quite a number of, of product, products. So um, the pipeline is, is changing and we are actually also trying to get information from other countries so hopefully at the beginning of next year after the survey that we plan to conduct, um, we'll have a, a better picture. We have at the moment from several countries, but not the, the entire uh, world. So on slide four, I'm showing just opportunities and challenges. Um, thinking about, for instance, great potential in the treatment. Um, on one hand as an opportunity. And there are a couple of examples that you're all familiar with, uh, like for CAR T cells, um, Himria, and uh, also um, for, for gene therapy, Luxturna, which is uh, restoring vision of inherited retinal disease patients, or uh, lentiglobin, which is genetically modified cell therapy, um, helping with the uh, um, uh, beta thalassemia uh, patients um, to avoid long-term blood um, transfusions. And um, also uh, the, the clinical trials uh, that are mentioned uh, for severe um, cycle cell disease. And there are also a number of, of issues uh, related to clinical trials that are very important during the development of, of products and sometimes are causing also delay in the development. So one of the challenges is obviously safety and these safety incidents that are reported in literature uh, and in, in media um, after um, receiving unproven stem cell therapy, for instance, this is one of, of the issues that um, we are going to, to deal um, with. But um, obviously, many countries are actually moving on and after several years of, of uh, um, working uh, closely with regulators in a number of countries, uh, we found that um, there are specific guidance uh, issued at national level uh, that are actually trying to prevent uh, use of unproven uh, um, cell therapy products, which is still, of course, not the ideal case, but at least there are efforts um, towards this goal. Uh, now, in WHO holistic approach to address uh, challenges, there are several teams or groups involved. You heard this morning uh, about some of the initi initiatives. So I just wanted to share with you that in addition to norms and standards for biologicals, where we work on standards for uh, regulatory evaluation of cell and gene therapy products, uh, there are activities this uh, last year, uh, obviously, um, with, with, the, with the establishment of measurement standards, which I'll show in a minute this year as well. And the development of white paper, which uh, uh, many countries recognize as an important step forward, has been postponed to 2021. We had actually planned uh, um, a big consultation in July this year, but uh, of course, uh, due to the COVID situation, we are postponing this. Uh, then another area is really in the area of international non-proprietary names, which is a, a very important issue. Um, a lot of work in, in that uh, uh, area as well. And then essential medicine list is, is including the most effective newly registered cell and gene therapies, which is quite uh, important as well. 
Now, the, the work related to pricing, affordability, and uh, intellectual property issues is also closely linked to, to our goal of promoting access to medical technologies and innovation. And uh, service delivery and, and safety are also um, activities uh, very important for um, the management of, of blood, blood components, and other medical uh, products of, of human origin. So um, finally, the, the global health ethics is uh, uh, an issue that is incorporated in all other uh, activities. And there is a global governance framework for human genome editing that is, is going on um, with the, their activities. So there are several groups and, and really a broad range of, of activities that um, you may be uh, interested for. Now, from norms and standards perspective, there are global written standards, um, which actually include recommendations and guidelines that are specifically intended to help um, regulators and developers, but also academia with the research and uh, uh, scientific developments. But there are also measurement standards that are intended to, to provide basis for, for the assessment of the quality and uh, safety of these products. Um, on the slide seven, you can see uh, the development of white paper on cell and gene therapy products for which um, the plan uh, uh, has been actually changed and we are now hoping that we'll manage to get this done in 2021. Um, the meeting of the working group that took place in February this year actually set the scene for, for this work. And there is a consultation with regulators, industry, and academia that is, is planned for 2021, hopefully the first half. Uh, now, the survey for cell and gene therapy product uh, regulation uh, has also been postponed due to the um, COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And now the timeline is that we, we are now also checking with our colleagues in regional uh, offices um, whether we can initiate the, the survey because the questionnaire was ready in the spring this year, but we were advised by regional colleagues not to initiate that because everybody was so busy and, and completely overwhelmed with, with COVID situation. And we also found ourselves totally uh, overstretched with the response to, to COVID-19 in terms of the vaccine development and monoclonals. But we are still actually planning the survey um, that will actually address the issues from, from country perspective and also from regional perspective. And for the international measurement standards, I just want to share with you um, uh, the information regarding the first international reference panel for the quantitation of lentiviral vector integration copy numbers and the first international reference reagent for lentiviral uh, vector integration site analysis. Uh, these standards were adopted by the Expert Committee on Biological Standardization in October 2019. And there are also standards that were endorsed by the committee. Um, one is uh, the first international standard for replication competent lentivirus and also the first international reference reagent for pluripotent stem cell identity for flow cytometry. So this was also endorsed last year. And now we have new proposals that will be as, uh, discussed in, in October meeting of the expert committee on biological standardization. One is on the mesenchymal stromal cell identity for flow cytometry for advanced therapies. And another one is um, international standard for mesenchymal um, stromal cells. So we hope that these measurement standards are really uh, contributing to, to the evaluation of, of uh, um, uh, cell therapy products. So I'll stop here and we'll be happy to, to discuss uh, or to answer questions. And I just want to acknowledge also um, the work that uh, uh, a colleague in my team, um, uh, Dr. Si Hyung Yu from, from Korea is, is doing in this area. Thank you, over. Thank you, Dr. Ivana. It was very informative. And uh, going forward, I'd like to invite uh, Kawaldi to ask some questions he might have. I believe we have a little bit of time for questions. Okay, uh, we just got one uh, question, and I think uh, that's uh, uh, coming to Dr. Ivana Kazovich. Uh, 
what they were asking was that within the universal health coverage 2030, uh, how are you going to incorporate these guidelines and uh, standards? Thank you. Yeah, thank you for this question. Actually, the universal uh, um, uh, health coverage will address also other issues, not only standards, but standards are always seen as very upstream and sometimes not really well understood. So I just wanted to share that this standardization work as a basis for regulatory evaluation and also sometimes regulatory decisions is, is um, kind of providing a um, background or um, let's say the, uh, one of the first steps together with INN nomenclature and, and these stuff. But other initiatives will also be addressing the universal health coverage. So what is very important for us is, is the feedback from countries. And this, this is also why this survey is, is planned because a number of, of countries are also um, thinking about improving access. And this is really the, the whole initiative for universal health coverage is to help countries uh, moving along with, with this and also uh, prioritizing diseases that are usually seen as, as a, at the bottom of, of um, kind of uh, um, lists of um, diseases, but also products that are related to these. Uh, thank you very much, uh, audience, and also for all the panelists. Uh, we have so many questions we have to ask. I think we will approach you individually later on and uh, send you some questions. We would like to get answers. But thank you for such a great time and really getting this session going. I think you've put the issue quite clearly on the agenda. And now I would ask everybody that uh, you have a mobility break. Uh, please return to the auditorium and wait to join the second session where we may be able to answer the essential question, uh, who will pay for these uh, therapies? Because we are looking at uh, health technology assessment and value-based healthcare and HTX. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, please uh, join us in the audience later. And thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, everybody. See you.